Welcome to our special feature celebrating the 120th birth anniversary of uh, J.R.D. Tata, the father of Indian aviation and the longest serving chairman of the Tata Group. Now today, as we honor a legacy that has not only shaped India's uh, industrial landscape, but also has set a different benchmark for corporate excellence globally. And in celebration of this remarkable journey, we have uh, collaborated with two titans of the business and the literature world, our Gopal Krishnan and Harish Bhatt. Now, their latest book, Jamshedji Tata, Power Powerful Learnings of Corporate Success is uh, not just another biography of J Jamshedji Tata, but this book is actually focusing and unveiling the timeless principles um, and uh, enduring philosophy that define the Tata brand and that have continued to define the brand over a century. So we are delighted to have the authors with us today for an engaging conversation. Argopal Krishnan and Harish Bhatt uh, exploring the powerful lessons and legacy of Jamshedji Tata. Welcome, Mr. Krishnan and Mr. Bhatt. It's a pleasure to have you both here on CNN News 18. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Kohinda. All right. So, uh, Mr. Gopal Krishnan and Mr. Bhatt, let's start by discussing what has... Uh, actually inspired you to write this book about Jim Sheji Tara because given the fact there are multiple books, biographies talking about the lives, experiences and struggles of Jim Sheji Tara. Now, what sets this book apart from the rest and what has actually inspired you both to pen down your experiences? So, Kuhina, this book was actually Mr. Gopalakrishnan's idea. I'm going to mm -hmm. request him to answer this question. Okay, so I'll let you, uh, I joined Tata's uh, at a rather late age. I was already 52. I had been vice chairman of Hindustan Diva earlier. And when you come at a late age to a new organization, you tend to be a bit of a skeptic, occasionally cynical. And I was very intrigued by the culture of Tatas and the constant reference to the founder and to JRD, the founder being Jamshedji and JRD and the principles of business. Gradually, I found as I traveled through the companies, that this was for real. It wasn't PR speak. And uh, I could feel this intimately as I went through the companies. And what caught my attention was there are many founders who've had wonderful principles, but very few have managed to sustain it over 150 years. Indeed. Everybody produces a baby in the family, but very few babies become... Uh, big, responsible, accomplished, and long-living. And that struck me about Tatas. Ram Guha, the historian at one of our events, like January, right. July 29th, then described Jamshedji Tata as one of the greatest Indians of the 20th century. And I said, when it comes from a historian of distinction, what did he mean by that? And I started to research it, and I started to see uh, what is so distinctive about Tata's, which uh, for very few companies in the world, it has been number one on the Indian business list for the last 85 years, since 1939. That doesn't happen to Fortune 500 companies. It has managed to retain and renew the original principles of the founder for 150 years. That doesn't happen to many groups. Indeed, yes. I wanted to collaborate with somebody and make it alive. And then I was waiting for Harish Bhatt to get a bit free from his engagements. <laughs> we decided about, the idea has been sloshing in my head for seven years, but I engaged in detail with Harish about three, four years, three years ago. And when he retired, he was able to give his time more fully. And we decided to do this in this two format. One is to explain what is a P, and we've got 10 Ps in the book, philosophy, perseverance, profits, and so on. And the second is to illustrate it with the story from the early years, from the mid-years, and the later years, to show that this prof attitude to profit or to principles has been built mm -hmm. for 150 years. Sarish, would you like to add anything to that? Um, so, Kuhina, I, I only have this to say that, uh, you know, Mr. Gopal Krishnan has been my mentor on my writing voyage, so I was delighted to get a call from him on my birthday in 2022, 8th of November, 2022, 
uh, asking me whether I would be happy to co-author this book with him. And I said, yes, of course, I'm delighted to co-author this book with you. And it's been a fascinating voyage uh, researching and writing this book on the principles of Jamshedji Tata. Quite a birthday gift, I might say that. <laughs> it was, indeed, indeed. All right. So, um, Mr. Bhatt and Mr. Gopal Krishnan, the legacy of Jamshedji Tata is rich with history, accomplishments, challenges, not just... Um, uh, on at the at a level where he's trying to evolve and build an empire for the nation, uh, but at a level where his life also saw a lot of challenges. Now, what research process uh, did you actually undertake to gather all the insights and stories featured in this in this book throughout? Again, I'm so, okay. Sorry, go ahead, Harish. Please, you can Mr. Go. Gopal, go, please go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to say how we arrived at this. Uh, what I call dumbbell formula, you know, to, to double weighted. Uh, I was very interested in what Jamshedji's philosophy was and how did it compare with his contemporaries. So I had to transport myself back to the 1890s, 1880s, and I read at least eight or ten biographies of people like uh, Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, Thomas Watson, and uh, I tried to illustrate these piece, as we call it in the book, each P, we're setting it not just in the context of Tata, but what might have influenced Tata and why he was distinctive. Why didn't Andrew Carnegie, why didn't John D. Rockefeller think of this at that time? Now, obviously, some of them thought of some other things. It is ridiculous right. to suggest that everything came only to Jamshedji. But right, nobody right. thought of all of these together. And that is the process of research. As a result of this book, I think I'm of his contemporaries and I started imagining his life. What would it be like to travel on a, a horse cart from Esplanade House in Bombay to the Ripon Club in Flora Fountain and walk across to the Watson Hotel which is across, and those buildings still exist. They are still there. They've got different names. And right. of course, my friend uh, Harish uh, packaged it with real stories, which are researched, and he will talk about that. So, so Kohina, to add to what Mr. Gopal Krishnan said, I think uh, I, I still recall a couple of conversations with Mr. Gopal Krishnan at the Bombay Gymkhana and at Bombay House as well, uh, mm -hmm. setting the direction for the book and uh, uh, looking at the framework in which we were to research and write this book. Thereafter, uh, I have been reading books about the Tata Group over the years. I must have read more than 15, 20 books about the Tata Group over the years. Um, and uh, I then identified which stories most illustrated each of the ideas of Jamshedji Tata. Which stories most represented, for instance, principles? Which stories most represented purpose? Which stories most res represented the responsible use of profits? Uh, and then, then of course, uh, I had to get some archival material for those stories, which I would get from the Tata Central Archives at Pune, uh, which was set up by Jamsh by JRD Tata himself several years ago. Uh, so I used that archival material for the older stories. For the more contemporary stories, I have also done interviews in the past for my previous books. And I did a few interviews for this book as well to be able to put those stories together. But but I love storytelling. Uh, and these are very, very inspiring stories. So they're actually very enjoyable to narrate. And uh, uh, some of them moved me even when I was writing the book. Um, then I think what we did was uh, mid-course, we sat down and uh, took stock of how the flow of the book was moving and uh, was it very coherent from beginning till end. Um, and once we got that right, I think then we moved towards publication. So that's the process of uh, discussion and research and writing that we used. Uh, Co-authoring a book is not the easiest of things, but I in must say in this case with Mr. Gopal Krishnan, it has been a fascinating and very enjoyable voyage. Was there any point of conflict when you guys were discussing or... Uh some point of contention where you both agreed yeah, there, to disagree, but probably then didn't uh, end up writing it in the chapters? No, there, there were a few points. For instance, there were a few stories that I proposed would go into the book, but Mr. Gopal Krishnan thought that maybe story X is better than story Y or makes the point more powerfully. Uh, so we had those discussions uh, like would happen in any collaboration between two people. 
Uh, but I think fundamentally no disagreement which was strong enough to wreck the book. <laughs> Mr. Gopal Krishnan, what are, what are your thoughts in, on this entire situation? You know, uh, what I realized, uh, as uh, Harish said, I have co-authored with uh, 10 co-authors before I co-authored with Harish. But right. this is the first time I was co-authoring with an experienced and uh, established and celebrated author in his own right. The others were all right. uh, first-timers. So I, in a sense, had a uh, authoritative, not authoritarian, <laughs> uh, relationship with them. Right. But here, uh, Harish had some genuinely good thoughts and not some not so good thoughts in the sense of uh, disagreement. But one of the great skills I've learned out of this is how to disagree without becoming disagreeable. Amazing. Uh, which is not something I've learned out of this, but that skill was becoming very important. Uh, most important, I must tell you how we came to agree. We required a mental model. Hmm. When you're talking of an iconic person who lived 150 years ago, hmm. and thinking of how the baton was transferred, the baton representing not responsibility, but the principles and the philosophy. Hmm. We were not sitting there in 1890 or 1915 or whatever. And so I developed a mental model, which I think is somewhat distinctive. And if I might, I will mention it because that brought us around. And the mental model I developed out of my reading, by the way, these 12 biographies, that's how it came into my head. Is mm -hmm. of, think of the Ganga. It has a Ganga tree where a small trickle of water comes out. Right. And at the other end, it is a fast flowing uh, bunch of uh, branches of tributaries and uh, Delta region in the West Bengal, okay, going into the Bay of Bengal. In between, it is slowly getting wider. It's following its own hydrology, but it's faithful to itself. But what the Ganga does, as we all know, not only Ganga, all great rivers of the world, by the way, they create stories around their banks. And so in Ayodhya, you'll have a story. In uh, Allahabad, you'll have a story. In Varanasi, you'll have a story. In Patna, you'll have a story. And around that story are certain iconic figures who are local. Right. I said, isn't that the same thing that's happened to Tata? Jamshedji Tata must never have thought that he's creating a great river. He wanted to do a business. He wanted to do for India what is right. He wanted to make profits because it's for the community. I call that the trickle. It's an idea. Every religion started with a trickle. Ten Commandments. Upanishad. Quran. And then various people and iconic people advance the ideas. And then there are undercurrents, differences of opinion. By the time we are practicing it, it is all in, you know, there is Shia, Sunni, there is Vaishnavite, there is Shaivite, and all sorts of complicated rituals. That's right. what we developed. And that's a very important part of the book in structuring our minds. Philosophy, icons, narratives, and rituals. And what we try to do is to sail down the Ganga together. And that helped a lot to coalesce the mind, at least for me. Since you asked me for my view, I'm sharing that. All right. Okay. Since uh, all of us were talking about uh, the contemporaries of Jamshedji Tara at that point of time, leadership patterns and styles have uh, eventually evolved over the years. All right. How has uh, Jamshedji Tata, how did his leadership style differ from uh, the other industrialists of his time? Uh, and how does it still stay relevant in the modern uh, uh, modern corporations or today's business uh, with today's business leaders? Go ahead, Harish. Uh, so, you know, the one difference that I see Kuhina very clearly uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've not studied all his contemporaries, but from the few contemporaries that I've seen, I've realized that everything that Jamshedji Tata did, particularly in the latter part of his life, was influenced by one central idea. Is this good for India? Is this good for the nation? So when Jamshedji Tata thought of Tata Steel, when he thought of establishing India's first integrated steel plant, or when he thought of establishing the Indian Institute of Science, India's first university of higher education in science, or the hydroelectric project. Uh, you know, all his dreams uh, were driven by his love of India and his love of the nation. That was the one driving factor in his life. 
Uh, and that, I think, made him stand apart from many of his other contemporaries. There must have been other industrialists world over, some of whom were driven by a similar notion. But in Jamshedji Tata's case, this was so, so strong that he traveled the world over to find the right technologists to come to India to establish right. Tata Steel here. Uh, so that's that's my single point answer to you, uh, the, the love of India. Uh, that's why R.M. Lala's biography of uh, Jamshedji Tata is called For the Love of India, in fact. Father, um, yes. Mr. Gopal Krishnan, uh, over to you. You have studied many, many, many of his contemporaries. So, right. Uh, Mr. Gopal Krishnan, I'd like to ask you, how can modern leaders actually learn from Jamshedji Tata's approach uh, that may have been relevant in those ages, but might hold a lot of relevance in uh, today's uh, uh, modern corporation uh, corporations or, uh, you know, corporate structures, organizational structures? Oh, that's an excellent question. I love it that you're asking that question because we are living in a world of startups. Right. And you know that startups... A baby is born, if I take the metaphor of a baby, yes. which are not required to survive very long. The baby must be fattened very quickly. Mm -hmm. They will become unicorns in five years and decacorns in 10 years. And then they are sold to somebody else. Now, we don't society really live that way. I've never met anybody of my contemporaries who says we produce a child to sell the child, unless it's a state of extreme difficulty and failure, right. which is Indeed. sad. Yeah. But people do that with companies and companies are live. And I have felt for some time, because I'm uh, long in the tooth, I've been around 55 years in the corporate sector, that India has industrial policies, but not philosophies. We can tell you what you can do, what you can't do. But a philosophy of an industry, hmm. be, and that's why we've written this book, without being preachy and telling other people how to do their things, that if you can put values into a child and raise the child with love and care, it is bound to become a long-lasting um, institution in service of society and the country. And without being preachy, it's best to illustrate. Just like your grandfather at home would tell you, Beta, hamare mein hum aise karte the. There are social. That's all. As simple as that. So we can't tell people this is the way to do it. And I would hope that one of my pet subjects, which I think I've touched upon in the book also, is mm -hmm. how India needs more she enterprises, S-H-E, which stands for Sustainable, Humane mm -hmm. and Enlightened Enterprises. Right. And the use of the word she, A, feminizes leadership. Jamshedji's leadership style was feminine. In the sense it was caring, it had a human touch to it. Whereas all the other biographies I read were highly masculine. Right. But uh, Mr. Gopal Krishnan, do, is there really a need for feminizing leadership positions uh, in the current uh, systems or approaches when the, it comes to leadership? The current system has uh, arisen because we have failed to feminize. I'm homeopathic in my approach, not allopathic. I'm not looking at the <laughs> symptom, I'm looking at the root cause. If, yes. we, if we had ventures which could at least be humane, enlightened, compassionate. Mm -hmm. I think this society and every society will be better off. And humane and compassion doesn't mean everybody has to be a Mahatma Gandhi. Because we've got other industrialists like Godrej, like Bajaj. Right. We have not referred to them in the book because that was not our remit. But they are also feminized in my view, in the sense of being sustainable, humane and enlightened. And as Alfred Marshall, the economist, uh, wrote in 1912, if India had many, many more Tatas, it would be a developed nation in no time. And today we are sitting in 2024, still trying to become a developed nation. He said that in 1912. Right. So, Mr. Gopal Krishnan and Mr. Bhatt, help me understand. Uh, we're talking about humane and a little empathetic aspect of being a leader and a leader of a conglomerate. Now, Jamshedji also came from a family that had fled uh, persecution and found his refuge in India. And this background might have instilled a lot of resilience and a you know, drive to create something in him. How, do you think Jamshedji Tata's background overall and personal experiences actually influenced his uh, entrepreneurial journey? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Kuhina. I do think his background and his experiences influenced him. 
Uh, Jamshed Ji Tata came from a uh, came from a family of Parsi priests. Okay, but but his father had already become a merchant, and he was part of his father's merchant trading firm for some time before he established the Tata Group. Now there were two three important experiences that I have come across, which I am sure influenced Jamshed Ji Tata's thinking. First, he spent a few years in London and the United Kingdom, and there he interacted with people like Dada Bau Nauroji, the uh, grand old man of uh, India. Uh, he was influenced by Dada Bai Nauroji's thinking. When he came back to Bombay, uh, he uh, you know some of his good friends included people like Firosha Mehta, the Lion of Mumbai. Uh, and from them, I think there were many, many nationalistic ideas that Jamshedji Tata developed. And, and his love for India, I think, got further, uh, further enhanced by that. That was that was one. Uh, the, the, the second thing, uh, Kuhina, you know, his very first enterprise was called the Empress Mills. It was a textile mill, not steel, not hydroelectric. And the story of that has been narrated in this book. He right. saw the workers in this mill and, and some of his most, some of his pioneering worker welfare innovations, like accident insurance, like the introduction of a gratuitous pension scheme, like the introduction of a provident fund for the workers, he actually experimented with at the Empress Mills. And, and that that gave him confidence. You know, he saw the motivation that was rubbing off on workers. He saw how much more productive they were becoming. He also saw how much happier they were becoming. That experience definitely in his mind, you know, uh, employees in the community widened out in his mind to the idea of the nation. Uh, so that was, that was, I think, the second uh, influence, early influence on Jamshedji Tata's later career. He traveled a lot, okay? He spent a lot of his time, early years, as well as later years traveling. Traveling to the US, to Japan, to Europe, uh, to the Middle East. He went, on a, he went on a long, long voyage to the Middle East. And I think his travels and what he saw around the world, whether it was new technology, uh, mm -hmm. whether it was, uh, you know, uh, how developed economies were doing, whether it was the suffering of people, uh, all these had an impact on him uh, and uh, and influenced the way his mind uh, thought. Uh, uh, he also got very good technologies from outside India, you know, not just for making steel, uh, but technologies for the creation of the Taj Hotel in Mumbai, technologies right. to create a farm in Bangalore. You know, uh, it's it's amazing to see how technologically savvy he was in his day and age. So, so that, that that kind of, to me, are a few of the influences that impacted Jamshedji. But mm -hmm. I'll request Mr. Gopal Krishnan to add to them from his research. No, there's not much more to add. I mean, he wasn't a buddy of mine or yours. But <laughs> what we can make out, uh, whether or not he was deeply religious, he was definitely very spiritual. Hmm. All right. Okay, I don't have a record of how many times he went to the Agyari or wherever. But the motto he chose was Huma Hutwa Harsta, which in Zoroastrianism means good deeds, good words, and good actions. Now, good thoughts, good good uh, thought, action, and word, uh, good word, thought, words, and action. And that uh, coat of arms sort of still adorns all the Tata companies. So there was something I call it spiritual, not necessarily religious. And that good words and thought with many other leaders are stated, but he actually transmitted to people. So that is one aspect I want to mention. The second thing I want to mention is mm -hmm. what he did and what in some way he put that good virus into other people uh, and his successors, even if indirectly, was look ahead embrace the future, don't live on the past. And that's very important because you see major corporations today getting out of date, getting caught flat-footed. Yes. When Jamshedji started, it was a textile company. By the time he died, it was planning to be a steel and electricity company. Right. And on his deathbed, he told his son, whatever ambitions you have, do it, son, but first do my two dreams. And the third dream was to make an Indian Institute of Science. His son, as a good uh, son of the father, did put aside all his own dreams and did those three, 1910 or 12, Indian Institute of Science, around the same time, hydroelectric and soon after, steam. You know, they're all around the period 1910 to 1913. And then he did his own things. By this time, Tata was no more a textile company only. Just, yes. Became a textile plus something else. 
Right. And gradually that went on. It became a consumer goods company. You might remember a company called Tata Oil Mills. Hmm. It became a shipping company somewhere down, which is described in the book, but that didn't succeed. And today we are talking of it becoming a software and chips company. So the renewal of Tata is a very important lesson for startups. And you asked the question a little earlier. And I think it's a very important lesson. It is, as uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt said, that's one of the biographies I read. He said to his son, I have made all this money within my one lifetime. But son, I'll tell you one thing. It is easier to make money than to harness money into future productivity. And in fact, it is Vanderbilt's son. Uh, unfortunately, from then on, it started getting squandered as it always happens sometimes in family businesses. But that did happen in Tata's. Right. In 1939, they were seen as the first uh, largest Indian enterprise. The uh, sales were 29 crores, 1939. Right. Today, we are talking of billions of dollars. So there is something magical that has happened. It may or may not be replicable, and we are no consultants on that. But it's a it's, it's a galactic phenomenon, if I may use that word. Or it struck us, at least, as a galactic phenomenon, which we wanted to share. You see, we celebrate industrialists. We say Andrew Carnegie, steel magnet. Yeah. Henry Ford, auto magnet. Thomas Watson, information processing magnet. Um, Yuan Trip, airlines magnet. He started Pan Am. Uh, we would say... Uh, um, uh, in chips, uh, there was uh, Bob Noyce. And uh, all of that rolled into one Tata over 120 years. I think it's uh, not just admiration. Don't forget that there are some people who are Bhakta Yogis. We are not Bhakts. There right. are some people who are Jnana Yogis because they are professors of management. We are not that. We are mere Karma Yogis. We are Kamaryatris. Without the controversy of the Kavar Yatra. <laughs> Indeed. Who Indeed, have Mr. walked through all the pathways and said, Kuch hai isme. And that's the result is a book. Right. So, like we're already discussing, uh, Jamsheji Tada's one personality aspect, uh, that balanced ambition with ethics in a very challenging environment in those days also. Uh, I request both of you to share some insights on how Jamsheji Tata actually managed to balance his entrepreneurial ambitions with ethical business practices and how is the overall Tata brand taking it further till date and living by day, every day in and out? Uh, Harish must answer that question because uh, he has written the stories behind it. And I want him to just focus on the early period, the middle period, and the later period, because he brings it out, uh, Harish brings it out very well. Go ahead, Harish. Yeah. So, so Kuhina, uh, let, let, let me, for instance, from Jamsheji Tata's time, let me describe the uh, a small story of yeah. a silk farm that he founded in Bangalore. Okay. Right. Uh, now, a silk farm was never going to be a huge business for him. The huge businesses that he was planning were already in steel and hydroelectric energy and so forth. So the silk farm, the silk farm would never have been a huge business proposition, but he still did it out of a sense of principles, purpose, and ethics because he wanted to create jobs for the local community, uh, and he wanted to advance the Indian silk industry. Uh, so there were some some things that he invested in out of uh, out of a sense of purpose and out of a sense of. Uh, uh, what was right to do by the local community rather than what was only right to do by way of growing a big business. If that was Jamsheji Tata's time, in JRD Tata's time, uh, I have, you know, there is a specific uh, chapter in this book which talks about the ethical dilemmas of JRD Tata and how he, how he resolved those ethical dilemmas. So, you know, let, 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 let me, let, let me uh, there is a story here which has been narrated by Dr. Irani in his biography. Um, uh, and which I have quoted about how JRD, a small incident of how JRD Tata lost a pen and why he refused to take an identical pen from Dr. Irani. Small matter of a missing pen, but it illustrated a matter of business, of ethics uh, in his mind and how those principles meant everything to him as, he was, as he was going forward. Uh, and if you come to the modern era, uh, there is, I've narrated here the story of Tata Finance 
where where something went wrong uh, within the group. This was 20 years back. Uh, and how the Tata group responded to it splendidly uh, and what it showed of the character of the Tata group. Uh, like Mr. Gopal Krishnan has often told me, you know, sometimes things go wrong with corporations, but good corporations don't brush them under the carpet. Uh, they actually face them and resolve those issues. So there yes. are stories in this book, uh, Kuhina, from the distant Jamshedji past, uh, from the JRD Tata era, from the modern era of the Tata group, which all address the subject that you have uh, talked about, how to right. balance business with what is right by the community, what is ethically right. There is one story I talk of here where I, where I personally saw what was happening. This was a company called Tata Coffee, where I used to be the chairman uh, until uh, last year. And... Uh, I have addressed the story here of how Tata Coffee had to address the issue of uh, uh, elephant man conflict on some of its plantations. And the number of steps they took, the amount of time and resources that Tata Coffee invested, the management of Tata Coffee invested in finding very thoughtful and good answers uh, uh, to that specific issue. Uh, you may say it has nothing to do with business, but then it has everything to do with business because that's how a really good cup of coffee is created. Um, so th there are many, many stories here, more than 20, 25 stories in this book. Uh, I may not have time to narrate all of them just now, uh, but uh, but they, they show exactly what you mentioned, the, the balance between... One of your incident. favorite. My favorite story uh, is actually from the modern age, uh, the one of elephants. But if I go a little uh, further behind in time, my favorite story is the story of how Dorabji Tata saved Tata Steel from collapse. In 1924... Tata Steel was on the verge of collapse. And Dorabji Tata, who was then the chairman of the Tata Group, received a telegram from Jamshedpur saying, we have no money to pay wages to our workers a week or two weeks from now. Now, Tata Steel at that time was already a publicly owned company. Indeed. But Dorabji Tata, who was the chairman of the Tata Group, said, I will not permit this to happen. He pledged his entire personal wealth his wife and he pledged their entire personal wealth, including at that time the largest diamond in the world, the Jubilee Diamond, to the Imperial Bank of India, raised one crore of rupees against that pledge and were able to keep Tata Steel going and were able to make sure that the wages of all the workers were paid. Of course, uh, Tata Steel then started doing much better in later years. This was in the aftermath of World War I, where the demand for steel had fallen, that Tata Steel was in such an issue. In later years, Tata Steel did well and they, they redeemed, their, they, they got whatever they had pledged back. But it's fascinating to me that a person, a chairman of a group or a, per, a person in charge is willing to pledge his entire personal wealth to, to save the wages of workers, to save the jobs of workers. That's a, that's a fascinating story and it's been told in great detail in this book. Indeed, it is one and it is one inspiring story also. Uh, but Mr. Um, Mr. Gopal Krishnan, my next question will be to you. Now, the we were talking about startups and startup cultures uh, and how business uh, is uh, perceived as a baby for a business owner who begins with the entire process and journey. Now, Tata Group's su success and journey has been over the last 150 but remarkable years. Uh, the group has also managed to stay relevant and successful over a century and a half. Learning from the lessons of Jamsheji Tata's leadership, uh, for a young entrepreneurs and you know business leaders, what would you guys advise them? Well, uh, speaking for myself, uh, it struck me some, some some years ago that if you keep saying Tata, everybody thinks of an old bearded man of 150 years ago. And somehow think he's my great-grandfather. I have nothing much to learn from him. <laughs> I therefore chose companies that didn't exist when I began my career. And I began my career, although my color of my hair may suggest a contemporary with Jamshedji Tata, I can assure you I wasn't. <laughs> I'm talking of the late 60s, early 70s. Okay. There was no company called HDFC. There was okay. no company called Biocon. There was no company okay. called Marico. And there was no company called TCS. There was no company called Infosys. There was no company called Wipro. And okay. therefore, I took some of these companies 
and undertook a research project with some academics because I thought that will be a closer example. We keep telling people startups and if I keep saying from Babur's time or Akbar's time this was happening, it doesn't sort of, they don't relate with it. Though today, uh, influences and the principles that they have followed, we have summarized into some other writing, not in this book, but there have been references to that in this book as well. Uh, high people orientation, a very fine balancing between short and long term, not being very short term orientated. And, you know, it's very difficult to get these balances right. And the third and the last, which is the most critical of the three critical ones, is what we've called um, critical thinking. And critical thinking means most of us, including myself, and I think I speak for Harish also, are geologists in our mentality. The moment right. you see something, you say, what is inside this? And we have been trained to analyze and find out what is inside it. But we must have an astronomer thinking, which is look up to the sky and say, what is this a part of? Roughly speaking, right. the geologist has a left-brained approach. The astronomer has a right-brained approach. We have to bring together the scientist and the poet. And that's not easy. But there's yeah, a, it's not. that's an element of that. And uh, Harish is a good example of a guy who writes prose and has written poetry also. And uh, we need that kind of, and the feminine part that I referred to earlier, that we talked about earlier, also adduces a bit to that. So I don't want to overdo this feminine, feminizing part, but in multiple ways that message comes across. How to bring the left and the right brain together, how to bring the male power-driven uh, approach to the sensitive, empathetic approach, uh, how to bring the geologist and the astronomer together, and I have written a book called Wisdom for Startups from Grown-Ups, also published by Penguin, by the way. And you see it, that green book on my left. Uh, and it's exactly that. I don't want to go into that book because that's not the subject of our discussion. Okay. Uh, uh, Kuhina, I would only want no, no, to no, add... No, no. Hello, are you there? Yes, yes. Oh. All of us are here. Can you hear us, Kapal Krishnanji? Haji, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Bhatti, you were saying something. Uh, no, I was only wanting to add two things, Kohina. Your question was, what can entrepreneurs take away from this book? From right. the research from the research I have done, first and foremost, Kohina, I think there has to be a clear sense of why this business. Why are we establishing a business? I think in, in the case of the Tata Group, one of the reasons for the longevity of the Tata Group, that it has lived on for 156 years now, has been a clear sense of purpose that the group should do something to add to nation building, uh, right. to the community. Right. And that has lived over the years through, as Mr. Gopal Krishnan said, through icons, through rituals, through uh, leadership of later eras, also focused on that uh, overarching goal. The second thing, Kuhina, I'd like to add, when I was researching the stories that have gone into this book, an extraordinary uh, focus on people. You know, in, in Jamshedji Tata's time, we have heard of Jamshedji Tata, but did you know that Jamshedji Tata had had in his team uh, icons like Bizonji Mehta, Burjorji Padsha, uh, Charles Page Perrin, uh, uh, R.D. Tata, uh, you know, his own elder son, uh, Dorabji Tata. Uh, so he, he worked with the iconic people as members of his team and was able to build a very, very strong team. That's exactly the same if you look at J.R.D. Tata, uh, whose 120th birth anniversary we are celebrating this year. J.R.D. Tata was able to build two teams of leaders twice over. In the 1940s, he had people like uh, uh, Adirshir Dalal, uh, you know, Sir Homi Modi, uh, people like Sir jo John Mathai as members of his team. And then in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, J.R.D. Tata's core leadership team consisted of people like, uh, uh, you know, Sumant Mulgankar, Rusi Modi, um, Nani Palkiwala, Darbari Seth, um, I can go on and on, but but uh, and and the same is the case during uh, Mr. Ratan Tata's era as as chairman. Uh, so across across every generation, uh, leaders of the Tata Group have been able to build very very strong teams, and and uh, with those strong leadership teams have contributed to the continuous transformation that the Tata Group has seen for over 150 years. So I don't want to overemphasize this, but I think for every entrepreneur. 
every startup, uh, every organization, the need to build very, very capable teams is and, and to focus on people is a key theme that is jumping out of this book. And many of the stories in this book actually focus on that specific area. Right. So, uh, gentlemen, we are running out of time. And I'll just throw the last question to you both. Now, every book, every author aims to leave its reader with a lasting message. Uh, we've largely covered what are we trying to talk about in the book. But one, one message in one line that you would like our readers to take away from this book named Jamsheji Tata Powerful Learnings for Corporate Success. Should I go with that, uh, Harish? First? Yes, yes. Uh, let's go one by one on this. So, so one message from me, uh, keep a larger purpose in mind for your business uh, and make sure that that larger purpose is protected and nurtured year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation. Find a way to make that happen. Find a way to institutionalize the larger purpose uh, in the fabric of your organization. That would be my single takeaway message from here. Uh, and the second takeaway message, of course, is that uh, at the end of the day, organizations are all about human stories. This book is all about human stories and human beings who have exemplified purpose, who have exemplified principles. So organizations are not inanimate objects. At the end of the day, they are human bodies. And, and that is what I think, that's the second message that I think people should take away from this. Uh, over to you, Mr. Gopal Krishna. Well, for me, it is uh, too much profit is also bad for your business. You know, we need oxygen to survive, but too much oxygen can kill you. Right. Too much profit too soon is bad for your business. And in case you chance upon too much profit too soon, don't throw it away. Use it for somebody else. Imagine that God has made you a content. That's my right. Right. Thank you so much. Mr. Gopal Krishnan, thank you so much, Mr. Harish Bhatt, for sharing your insightful insights and bringing life uh, the remarkable journey of one India's greatest industrialists we've had. For anyone seeking to understand the essence of corporate success, go grab uh, this book named Jamsheji Tada, Powerful Learnings for Corporate Success. It is a must read and uh, I must tell you it is a little different read from what there is available on biographies of uh, the Tata brand or Jamshedji Tata. So uh, this is your cue. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for talking to CNN News 18. It was an honor and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Puhina. Thank you for your interest in our book. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All the very best for the launch, guys. Thank you.